Today is a good day to die. Do you agree? I think as we read this passage, you'll see that that is true. Today is a good day day to die is a phrase that has been attributed to Sitting Bull, a Native American fighter, warrior. It's, of course, been used in popular culture since then. But the legend is that before he ran into battle, he looked at his warriors and said, today is a good day to die. And then they went into battle. As we go through this book of Romans, we're in our sixth week, and the theme of death emerges strongly in this passage. But attached to it is the theme of life. As a matter of fact, Paul is going to compare and contrast several things. He's going to compare and contrast death and life. He's going to contrast the old with the new. He's going to contrast the law and grace. And he's going to contrast physical things and spiritual things. This whole thing comes in the middle of a discussion on the value of law versus the value of grace. And at this point, Paul's critics think that he's gone too far with the idea of grace. In chapter 5, Paul says, where sin increases, grace abounds all the more. What he meant was the more sin somebody has, the more God has to put grace into their life to bring them out of that life of sin. But Paul's opponents were worried. They were saying, Paul, if you talk about grace too much, people are going to sin too much. You can't give them too much leeway. You can't give them too much license. And so Paul deals with that in chapter 6. Let's look at verse 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? It's almost as if Paul knows exactly what they're thinking and what they're going to ask, and so he asks it for them. Should we continue in sin just so that we can experience more grace? He says, by no means. In the original language here, it's pretty interesting. This is a very common phrase by no means, it's, it's strong language for the, for the Hebrews. It would be like saying, are you joking? Heck no, there's no way. It doesn't make any sense to continue living in sin because Paul says we are dead to sin. Verse three says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his what? Death. Death. We can't live in sin because we are dead to it. Let me ask you a weird question. How many of you have seen a dead body? I remember the very first time I went to a funeral. It was my grandfather's funeral. It was the first time I saw a dead body. It took me by surprise, the the stillness of that body. Now, maybe you've not seen a dead body, but you can imagine, say you've gone to the grocery store and you go to the section where they're selling fish, and there on the ice is the fish, like this. (laughs) There is no motion, no movement, no action, no will, no decisions, no nothing. And Paul says, you're dead to sin. Now, he's not talking about a physical death. Obviously, he's talking about a spiritual death. What's the difference between physical and spiritual? Well, that's pretty simple. Physical things you can see, you can taste, you can touch. But spiritual things are largely unseen. Spiritual things are felt. Spiritual things are understood. Spiritual things are processed with emotion and with heart. And so Paul says in verse 4, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism then becomes the spiritual or the symbolic type of death, burial, and resurrection. How many of you have been baptized? You remember the process. There's some water available Uh, You make a confession of faith, you hold your nose, and then you go under the water. 
when you come back out of the water, you're raised to newness of life. The idea is it's a picture, it's a symbolic or spiritual picture of you dying and being buried, just like Jesus Christ died and was buried. And when you come out, you're coming out to newness of life in exactly the same way that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. It's something you do that's physical, but it represents something that's spiritual. We have a lot of things in our life that are physical that represent something that is spiritual or something that we believe in. Am I right? Now, I am a Lions fan. The Detroit Lions, that is. I know. I know. But it's interesting because when you go to see a football game, for example, and you're watching the Lions play the Bears, you're not really watching Lions playing Bears. Although that would be really actually pretty interesting to watch. Those are their mascots. The idea is the lion represents something about the team. Maybe that it's fierce uh, or that it's hungry or it wants to fight. The bear represents something about the team, that it's powerful. So you see that we have this all over. The American flag is another one. It's a physical thing that represents something that we believe in, something that's symbolic. A wedding ring is the same thing. A wedding ring is something physical that represents something symbolic. Baptism is a powerful symbol of your spiritual death to sin. When you were baptized, you died to sin. As a matter of fact, a few verses later, Paul will describe this as killing the old self, or a more direct translation is killing your old man, which is weird. But here... This is beautiful. This is a symbolic death. You're obviously physically alive after you come out of that water, but symbolically you died and symbolically you were reborn. Now in verse five, he'll expand on this idea of being new. He says, for if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be reunited with him in a resurrection like his. And I love this because the word united really jumps out at me. In the original language of Greek, the word is sumphytos. Sumphytos, it means grown together or united with. You probably recognize it, but this is where we get our word for symphony. How many of you are fans of the symphony? Oh, so cultured. I remember my first time going to the symphony. It was kind of exciting, and uh, you know the, the orchestra was up there. And at first, though, it was a little bit... Strange, didn't sound very good. They were all warming up. Matter of fact, it kind of sounded like this. Take a listen. Now, this is not symphytos. This is not being unified and being together, is it? This is everybody doing their own thing. But once the conductor taps his little stick, what is that called? Baton. Baton, thank you. <laughs> I knew you guys were cultured. Once he taps it on there and the orchestra is ready, it sounds something like this. That's good. So you can see a huge difference here. Here's kind of the idea. Paul's saying that beef. Can you cut that? I can't turn it off. Okay. You can see the difference. Paul is saying, look, before you were disunified, you were not on the right page. And it sounded like a cacophony. It sounded, it sounded bad. But you died with Christ symbolically and you were united with him 
in death and resurrection, and you're like a symphony. Imagine that, you and Jesus Christ going to the cross together, united, being buried together, united, being raised again, united. When Jesus died on the cross and was raised again, his actions killed death. In a way, Jesus put death to death. Paul finishes this thought with a reminder in verse 11. He says, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And then he begins to give them some instructions. Verse 12, look at that with me, please. He says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey the passions, to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. You might have picked up on something there. Two words, or maybe three, mortal and members. And then later he says instruments. Now, is Paul talking about spiritual things here or physical things? Here he's talking about physical things. Your body, your, the members of your body. They're like instruments, he says. And what he's saying is, the result of what we believe spiritually has an impact on what we do physically. See, the law is kind of the opposite. The law is this list of rules. And it's mostly physical things that the Jews were supposed to do. You know, remember in this series, we've been talking about this. So I'll give you a little review a few weeks back. The issue here in the Church of Rome is that some of the Jewish believers were trying to convince the Greek believers that there were some rules that they had to follow, some of these Jewish rules. That was called the law. And they were physical things, like there were certain things that you had to do with your hair. You had to wear it a certain way. There were certain clothing things that you had to wear. There were certain foods that you were allowed to eat and not allowed to eat. Um, the big issue at hand here in the Greek church or the Roman church was circumcision, that the Jews were saying, no, in order to really be a believer in Jesus, part of the Old Testament law says you have to be circumcised, and they didn't want to be that. So under this law, which the Jewish Christians were trying to convince the Greek Christians, they had it backwards. Their idea was that physical things we do would impact our spiritual life. Do you see that? Are you guys following? That there's things you have to do physically that would measure the things that you were believing in spiritually, and you understand a little bit of how that works because physical things are measurable. Like, if you're wearing your hair in a certain way, then I can see that and I go, oh, you must be spiritual. Or if you're eating certain foods and not eating other foods, I go, oh, I, I can see that. that that's, I, you're a spiritual person. Or, for example, circumcision, which is really strange to think about it that way. But in the Greek culture, nudity was fairly common. So this idea of being marked by circumcision is like, oh, I can see that you're a spiritual person. But it doesn't work that way, not since the time that Jesus came, because Jesus turned this whole thing around. While the rules of the Old Testament were holy, righteous, and good, Paul says that later in chapter 7, they only worked, he says, to show us how, how off track we were or how far we were away from God's ideal. Jesus turns the whole thing around by saying this, look, don't worry about the rules. I'm gonna save you before you become worthy of being saved, or I'm gonna save you before you can follow those rules. I'm gonna conquer death for you, and then I'm gonna call you to something higher or something better. I'm going to use grace to do that. And that's one of the things that's unique about Christianity is grace. Sometimes the church, and this is what's happening here in Rome, but sometimes the church tries to turn back time and turn back to the law by using rules or setting certain standards for people to live up to, not realizing that what they're doing is they're reverting back and putting themselves under the law. You ever been to a church like that? You ever been to a place like that where they believe that there's certain things you have to do in order to be a good Christian. 
Now, I'm not talking about rules uh, inside the church that are for order or rules in the children's ministry or rules that keep the congregation safe. I'm talking about things that people um, try to convince you to do in order for you to believe that you're a good Christian or in order for you to believe that you're a Christian at all. Like, for example, if you go to a place and someone tells you, well, a Christian should tithe 10%, and that's the number. Well, that's an Old Testament rule. That's somebody trying to put you back under the law. The New Testament is clear when it comes to giving. You decide on an amount that you can give freely between you and God, and then you give it generously. That's grace. If someone tells you, well, in order to be a good Christian, in order to follow Jesus the right way, you have to serve X amount of times a month or X amount of times a year. That's the law. Or if they say you have to attend a certain amount of times or dress a certain way or read a certain version of the Bible. That's not grace. That's the law. And we need to be careful about that. So Paul says, dead to sin and alive to God. And you might be thinking this. Yeah, I I get that, but I struggle with sin. I screw up. How do I become dead to sin? Like, how do I make that a reality in my life? Well, there's no secret to this. I think there's a solution. Paul starts to talk about it in this next section. Look at verse 17. He says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of, what's your Bible say there? Slaves of righteousness. He says, look, you died to sin, you were a slave to sin. You were alive to God, now become a slave to God. Become a slave to righteousness. The slave idea of uh, putting yourself out there, remember, in, in the context of this culture, slavery is different than what you may be thinking. The, the kind of slavery that our culture experienced was quite a bit different than what Paul's talking about here. Slavery in our culture it historically had to do with skin color and keeping people down, and thank God that that has been... Um, uh, I know we continue to battle it in our culture, um, But what Paul's talking about here is this idea of volunteer slavery. He talks about this frequently. He says Jesus was a slave. This is this idea of being a bondservant or putting yourself um, in service of something. He's saying rather than put yourself in the service of sin, put yourself in service to righteousness, to God. And look at verse 19. He kind of clarifies. He says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations But just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more unlawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So what are your members? Remember, he's talking about physical things. Your members, your hands, your eyes, your mouth, your ears, your feet, your legs. Literally, that's what he's saying. He's saying if, you're, if your members were slaves of righteousness, meaning your hands used to do things that your hands shouldn't have done, your feet went to places where they shouldn't have gone, your eyes were focused on things that they shouldn't have been focused on, your mind was thinking about things that they shouldn't have been thinking, if your members now become slaves to righteousness, it's the opposite. Your hands are going to be doing things that your hands should do. Your feet will be going places where your feet should go. Your eyes will be looking at things you should look at. Your mind will be thinking about godly things. Your tongue will be speaking the truth in love and encouragement. And I like how he says they're to to be presented. Like, hey, here they are. Put them to good use. Here's my mind. Put it to good use. Here's Here's my voice. How can I use it for you? Here are my feet. Here are my legs. Where can I go to be used for righteousness. What if you went to your church leaders, your small group leaders, your pastors, and said, hey, I'm presenting my members to be used as righteousness. After you explained that that was from the book of Romans, in case they were worried, 
You would say, wow, that's amazing. What can I do? Where can I go? How can you use me? What if you went to your friends and said, hey, I, I just want to present to you whatever I can do for you for righteousness. What can I do for you? What if you, this is a game changer. What if you went to your wife or your husband and said, hey, I present to you my members for righteousness. What can I do with my hands? What can I do with my feet? What can I say to you? You might end up doing the dishes that night. Yeah, you might, you might end up doing that. Um, but you see the idea, and maybe there's something to that. Uh, this is not a Bible thing, but this is a common phrase. Um, uh, what is the phrase? Idle hands are the devil's. Oh, idle hands are the devil's work. S- something like that. <laughs> That's not in my notes, obviously. But, you know, the idea is if you're busy doing things for God, it makes it harder to allow your members to be doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Now you say, I get that, but it's still so difficult. Maybe you feel that way. You know that even Paul struggled with this? The guy who's writing this and is encouraging them, later in chapter 7, if you look forward, he says himself, he says, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Have you ever felt that way? Like, I just want to do the right thing, but I just struggle, or I can't do it, or, uh, and the things I don't want to do, I find myself stuck in this, in this pattern. Now, here's what I think is at the core of all of this in this section, is understanding the difference between physical and spiritual. That's what Paul's really talking about. And maybe a good way to say it is understanding the part that you play and the part that God plays. Because the part that you play might be physical, but the part that God plays is spiritual. If you're trying to win this battle against sin in your life, and you're trying to win it on the physical plane, then you're fighting your battle in the wrong realm. Like if you're like, okay, well, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to make sure that I do the right thing. Remember, Paul says this later, and I'll put it up on the screens, Ephesians 6, 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That's physical. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the what forces? Spiritual forces of evil in the heavy, heavenly places. There is a spiritual battle. Spiritual things are mostly unseen. They're felt, they're understood, they're processed with emotion and heart. Fighting the battle of sin starts at a spiritual level. It's a spiritual battle. How does Paul start chapter six? He says, you are spiritually dead to sin. I want everybody to say, I am spiritually dead to sin. I think the next time you are faced with a temptation with your members, going to the wrong place, doing the wrong thing, thinking the wrong thing, seeing the wrong things, you say to yourself, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, I am spiritually dead to sin. I can't live in it any longer. That's where that battle starts. And who won that battle for you? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ won that battle on the physical and the spiritual level. So today is a good day to die. Die to yourself, die to sin, die to the law, and to come alive in righteousness, to come alive to freedom, and to come alive to God. Let's pray.